Welcome to all two. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Best Materials Project. Today's lecture we're going to talk about uh, C++. Uh, probably everything you don't want to hear about C++, everything you don't want to know. Alright, so we're not really going to uh, <coughs> go into the programming language itself. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we'll just have a quick rundown of basically everything else. So uh, we'll start at the end. So in the end, uh, you kind of want a project out there uh, that's a living, breathing project, a product. Uh, it's got sales, contemporary users and what have you. So all of the steps you need to achieve uh, to get to that level it's kind of a long way to go. You obviously need a computer. You need a web server uh, that's set up as a source repository. You need a lot, a heck of a lot. And like right now, there's a massive trend like towards GitHub, what have you, where uh, you were uh, basically you're just an individual programmer or what have you. You just uh, using. Uh, whatever Visual Studio code on your whatever laptop, whatever operating system, whatever you just code in a way. Uh, we want to look at things uh, from an eagle eye perspective. So if we look at things from an overall view, we kind of like want to uh, we want to realize that there's a bunch of stuff that uh, that needs taken care of first, and only when all the parts are in uh, position uh, can we get uh, any any utility or use. Uh, so. The idea is to so change your perspective as uh, as a C plus plus programmer from an individual C plus plus programmer to kind of like a completionist, as somebody that knows all the uh, the different stages and that. It's a heck of a mountain, right? I mean, it's a hell of a study, and uh, obviously it's got a going on, you know, ongoing thing. Like obviously, people spend decades and decades and decades on it. Other people, you know, they just rock up and spend a few minutes on it and what have you. So, yeah, you could say that, uh, depending on your perspective, what you're trying to get out of it, uh, what you're trying to achieve. But So, uh, we need, uh, basically, we need everything. So, rather than, so, uh, rather than just being sat there programming and individually programming an application, it kind of doesn't work like that in industry. And your individual skills, uh, so... so Kind of like yes, you can trade on that your individual capabilities a C plus plus program, but there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that's uh, necessary. Really, there's a heck of a lot to get through. Really, just before you can even sit at your desk, uh, log on to the GitHub or whatever, Git G or Git H, or whatever Git G slash H or whatever you're using, SVN, whatever Visual Studio, the rest of it. So you got to understand that. Uh, the idea behind it is uh, to allow individual individual changes and then to push those individual changes out there to the software that's out there in the world. That's why you also need a web server with a repository. And uh, you kind of need... Yeah, if you're programming a standalone app for a particular thing, like personally, then maybe you can skip all of this, but certainly if your business depends on a software product, whether that's an internal software product, you're uh, perhaps trying to save money on uh, Windows Server Client Access Licensing, for example. Maybe you want to look at uh, open source, Linuxes, uh, what have you, Fedora, Ubuntu's, what have you. So there's a bunch of stuff, really, before we can get to the stage where uh, a user uh, can download your app uh, whether it's a free app or whether it's an internal business app. Uh, and there, ha there has to be everything in place before that is achievable. Something that is a long, long journey, really. And something that, uh, basically, if you look at tech companies, uh, Android, Apple, Samsung, to a lesser extent, Samsung, Huawei, you could prob perhaps include Huawei in it, but certainly Microsoft, Apple, uh, to a certain extent, Sony as well, uh, so for the end user uh, and end user experience, so what happens is they, they just visit the website, download the application, install it, which means that you're going to have to provide all of that in the first place. 
which is why uh, a platform like Universal Windows Platform with C Sharp and .NET is kind of like the most expensive, but also there's a, a massive saving in there because they've got a bunch of emulators and that, and they can push onto many platforms. You have Apple, of course, you need an Apple Xcode environment, and obviously you need to be able to sign a certificate. And if it's to be assessed and put on the store, the Apple Store, it's safe for Google Android. Google Android is probably the easiest version of it, which takes care of every little thing. So, start to finish. Yeah, you could individually put out an app uh, on an app, uh, Android, probably. Of course, uh, you have to look at the end user in the world. They kind of like most people are probably half the people on the planet are using an Android smartphone. The other half are using an iPhone or whatever. And then maybe it'll be thirty percent, forty percent on Samsung. All right, so yeah, the microchips. Uh, the different sort of assembly language instruction sets, whether it's RISC or CISC, uh, ARM, assembler, and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's massive billions of proliferation out there uh, of devices, standards, platforms, versions, operating systems, etc., etc., etc. And this is part of the engineering design on one hand, but also business structures on the other hand. So, for example, Apple can force everybody on the planet onto the new M1 or M2 microchips, for example, so you have to go through them, which means it kind of forces everybody to upgrade. Uh, we've all been there, we've had a phone that uh, no longer supports the applications and stuff like that. Say, for example, your latest banking app or what have you, these to have some uh, security features that aren't available on older generations and stuff that may be too easy to hack or something like that. So there's also that business sort of perspective where businesses are going to force everyone to upgrade uh, so we have that as well and then obviously the proliferation of devices so you've got xbox you've got a variety of xboxes you have a variety of mobile phones handsets tablets uh set top tv boxes as well where uh, perhaps we can uh look at Oh yes, there may be some smart tv applications as well so again it, so the c plus plus uh is kind of like uh, the abstraction where you'll uh, abstract everything from uh, any particular platform you see so the software and the source code a bit like uh, user experience design and user interface design or prototyping with Figma or Adobe XD in a sense that that abstraction so you have to go through different layers of engineers and different software guys and different database guys and what have you to actually realise that. But in the user's mind or how the user works with the platform or the application, for example. So that's a good abst abstraction. It's a great abstraction to do. Uh, it's pretty helpful, really. Uh, something that's new to me, actually. I've been doing a little course on that, uh, user, user experience UX, user design, user experience design. So the C++ language itself and all of the software and all and all of that and the actual files of the code, the .cpp and the .h files and stuff like that. And obviously the build scripts and, and it get you know it gets a bit more into that. But that's kind of a way of abstracting it into human language or as close to human language as possible. So the idea is that you can set up your tech stack from you know microchip, assembly language, operating system, uh, performance considerations, etc. And uh, have one, you know, pie in the sky C plus plus repository or repo or have your source code project, and then collapse it using a variety of build tools and a variety of build methodologies to target each uh, in particular platform. For example, it could be the same software, but it just runs on ARM, or it can run on a new Apple M type chip. It can run on uh, a variety of Intel chips and stuff like that. So. The whole point of the whole entire C++ phenomena is to be able to achieve that. You know, you can program in C++ and you can drop it onto any platform, any operating system, etc. So that's the ideal. But there's also business considerations where different compilers don't support different uh, sort of assembly language instruction sets that don't support different microchips, that don't support different operating system versions. And that's actually where a lot of the uh, frustration occurs, like you get tons of problems for that. But we can abstract a basic build source setup. So you're going to need 
uh, which is something that is a key part of platforms. Uh, it's a key part of Android strategy. It's a, it's a key part of uh, Apple strategy. It's a key part of Microsoft strategy. Sony, obviously, with a PlayStation, etc., etc., etc. So, what do you do when you've done a game? For example, you have to go to Sony, and then it has to be entered into the Sony website, so all the people on PlayStation can download and play your game. See, so a whole bunch of technical infrastructure needs to be in place already before you even get to uh, programming C++. That's why a lot of C++ projects did language. It's not because your C++ is poor or you're you're a poor developer. Uh, I kind of of repeat myself a bit when I say this, but by now, uh, your C++ guys are pretty decent, pretty cool. And a lot of the academic talk, uh, etc., but it's got to be, so looking from a commercial perspective, from a business perspective, it's got to translate into the real world service. So we look at things like agile, scrum methodologies, and continuous service, continuous improvement, continuous in- integration, uh, continuous development. And there's all these sort of software development life cycles and what have you. You've probably encountered them before. But the fact that it might resist, yeah, for it to be a, a success out there, where it's internally. You try and save money internally on internal systems and structures, or you're selling a product to the general public, for example, externally. There's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be in place first. Like, for example, no different from the web. As a matter of fact, we're looking at ways of uh, attaching on to the website uh, using some secure socket slaves or some TCP IP, which is basically packetized communication over your mobile phone or tablet or over the Wi-Fi or over broadband. And so one obvious example, obviously, would be the Microsoft Windows operating system itself. So this has its own uh, server, okay, that does updates, for example. So the Microsoft update server, for there to be operational updates, uh, Joey checks for updates and it downloads the package and it installs it and it wipes over the parts that need updating. That is what I'm talking about, basically. You need to get that service up and running. It's a big job. It's expensive. It costs. Uh, I think, realistically speaking, even on open source, say, for example, if you're using Linux Fedora Client and Linux Fedora Server combined, it's still you can still expect that to cost uh, tens of thousands of pounds a year, basically. Realistically speaking, like, if we're going to be realistic about it, but the... Technological sort of stuff, uh, it, uh, uh, it it makes possible a bunch of stuff, uh, basically. So, obviously, in-app purchases. So, how much does Apple, as a company, as a corporation, profit from in-app purchases? So, all software in the Apple Store can have in-app purchases, and it ties in with the platform's banking system. And Apple, of course, take a percent of the sales. So, that in itself is a massive strategic uh, and corporate, and, and it's a business consideration, really, it's important. Same for Microsoft's store, in particular Microsoft games, with the Xbox and Windows PC gaming phenomena. Something that, uh, open source, yeah, it goes against the ethos of open source to put a price on it and put money on it, but paid-for products tend to be better than products that you get for free, on average, cause just because of the time and support and the resources are available in there. So, beforehand, we need to do a whole bunch of stuff before we can even consider having a software product out there, whether it's an operating system, whether it's an application, uh, or even in-house. You could be running a small call center and looking to save all the Windows business objects, Microsoft client access licenses and stuff like that. There's also, as the generations proceed, software itself throughout the different versions of C++ itself, the compiler, the builder, the linker, the packager, and obviously the repository. But also, uh, there's, generally speaking in today's world, there tends to be a background server that applications are connected to. And that it also needs running. It needs to be available 24-7, 365. There needs to be skilled staff that understand all of this. And this is where I find that a lot of C++ sort of program is a, there's a kind of a languishing sort of thing going on there where you know there's there's a bit of a, an interconnect or an engagement issue here whereas your C++ developers sometimes can get lost for donkey's years and they know how to do everything in C++ but they can't really 
They don't really have the skill set of launching a product in the real world and maintaining it. And they don't really get a lot of the benefits of of, of the tech as well. So they're not realising uh, the benefits or, or perhaps even understanding the reason why there's a bunch of stuff in the C++ language anyway. Not really, uh, not really getting it. All right, so it's one of them. Yeah, there's web free and peerless or or peer to peer sort of web free tech with crypto or blockchain. But uh, that then again, that's uh, is it a completely and totally different story? Uh, the wild wild west of the internet really is this web free and crypto and blockchain. It's crazy, really. But that in itself, you always have got to remember that. Uh, a lot of software projects they need features correctly pricing like so features themselves cost so a lot of people put a bunch of stuff in there and they don't like pricing these complex finance instruments or what have you it's a complicated uh, sort of like reckoning if you can uh, you know understand that so you also have to look at your software in terms of costs per feature for example you could have some features say for example you go to support a linux platform as well as a windows platform and then you'll find that like 99 percent of your problems come from five percent of your customers because they're on linux and that in itself like as a business decision might not be uh, a clever decision like for example that so if you're spending 99 percent of your tech support on only five percent of your customers there's an issue there and you also have to factor that in to the cost also there's a heck of a lot uh, it gets complicated there's a lot of little parts here and there so that's why bringing everything into the bundle and having your own software location that uh, people can download your software from but also having a web background uh assuming the firewalls on the end user computers lets it through and there's network connection between source and the server you can get to uh, basically explore data on a very big level across your user base or how many products are installed for example so there's a tier one sort of Microsoft Microsoft update sort of thing. Every version or every copy of Microsoft that's out there on the planet is software, and it's running. It has a connection to the uh, Microsoft update server, and so it gets its updates pushed. So that's really where we want to be. So we're going to use that as our uh, ideal. Ideally, in the end, you want a server that you can push updates from. So we really need to set everything up, compile, build, link, package, okay, deploy. So the deploy phase, uh, obviously over the web is simple. You could have a little bundle on your website. Uh, it could be nothing more than a zip bundle or even an MSI of Microsoft installer or like a, an RPM or a Debian package or what have you. And it can have some software logic in it uh, that connects the web server. So you can have other areas of your website you can put little modules on the back end of your website to interact with bundles, especially if uh, a crypto wallet, in essence, bef- behaves like this in general, but kind of a, it's one of them. If you put exchanges in wallets, you really would have Web3 uh, in this crazy wild, wild west of crypto exchanges and stuff like that. But for now, that doesn't seem to be available. But if you did, then yeah, you'd be able to do away with the whole client server architecture and that whole engineering principle behind it but then again you uh you, know, you wouldn't have tech support to lean on you wouldn't have a pay for product that has had investment in it all right so c plus plus developers uh we'll assume that your c plus plus is good enough but we'll also begin at the end and end at the beginning because in the end you want end users to be able to double click on the web page or use some command lines on linux and download and install your software you see and then when you know hundreds of thousands of users are using that software or millions or even tens of millions or hundreds of millions yeah or whatever billions of people using that software in terms of android apple and microsoft you kind of can't not use an apple and android microsoft or a linux for example you can't, kind of can't do that <laughs> like so they're getting data a, a, a billion a billion end users for example or certainly yeah i would say so yeah 500 600 700 million people maybe using microsoft at any one time maybe a billion same with apple same with android 
So that key technical loadout, that sort of like distribution uh, and update architecture, is something you need to get uh, you need to get it to grips with and realise that that's kind of more important than your C plus plus development skills because that's where you actually get to see the reason why there's all of this inside of the C++. Uh, and that's really what you want. You want to be in a position where instead of building software from scratch every time, you already have a healthy user base that has a dynamic project that's alive and is used in the real world. Uh, and that's where this whole 24-7, 365 continuous integration or continuous development or content delivery network, CDN sort of thing is occurring. Uh, as long as you can deliver, you can sell. And as long as you can sell, you can make profits, which is the kind of like the business management and sort of accountancy idea that's meant to be going on top of it. All right, so that, that in a nutshell is kind of what we're going to be looking to achieve uh, going forward. Uh, some training uh, resources uh, for your house guides and, and getting that because we kind of are already in it anyway but it's also kind of essential and that part of understanding you might not really get why there's a bunch of stuff in there until you see it at, at group level uh, at armada level at fleet level and then you can become understand the power of networks very big networks very large networks and it's amazing. It's almost holographic. It's almost a holographic sort of thing where, you know, whatever, tens of millions of people will be playing Call of Duty at any one time. And if of those tens of millions of people, maybe two or three million, maybe they translate one in ten customer, two in ten customer to a paying customer. So that ability, yeah, to have a couple of million people at any one time pay for a product it's unheard of historically previously and it kind of can only be achieved using this sort of... Yeah, the web free and crypto is an alternative way of doing it where, you know, the computer algorithm takes a percent and whoever's running the crypto exchange can get some percents of trade or what have you. So be it. It's kind of a different architectural model, but it nevertheless needs to be up and running. It needs to be available 24 7 365. So there will be some translations out there. And obviously... Uh, well, anyway, so that's that's the idea, basically. So the idea is we start at the end, the end at the beginning. So in the end, you have you know millions of users using your application, whether it's a video game, it could be a music thing, it could be an educational tool, etc., etc., etc. And there has to be a whole heap of tech already in place, such as web servers, websites. And then you get into the real reason why C++ has got a bunch of stuff in there, for example... Uh, then you'll get to see, uh, uh, and in particular, like uh, you get to see, oh, how do I provide a unified service across all platforms? Then you begin to see, oh, how do I do things like have payment processing, for example, uh, inside of your application? There could be a direct link there, and and it will trigger the web service or communicate back with a website. You have to learn a program. That that's where you get that public private sort of class friend sort of and inter-process communication and stuff like that somehow or other object corba if you remember back in the days the object request brokerage com decom uh etc etc so you get a bunch of stuff like that it's kind of what's happening in smart contracts and uh, apis anyway but even down a button inside of a package does have a, a very real cost if you're going to look at it in terms of commercial consideration it's something that uh, you've got to think about so Ideally, and this can be done on a one-to-one -one basis, so really a lot of people are developing on a laptop. You need another laptop, that's a server, basically, and you also need a network switch, preferably not, like, you know, so you need a whole network, and then you can see how to split up different functions in your source code. For example, this uh, source code here might have a bunch of, oh, Real heavy computation. It could do with some three D acceleration, etc. And uh, put an NVIDIA, uh, put a headless NVIDIA uh, GPU on the server, and that way your end user may have very puny computational power, but gets absolutely fantastic graphics and visuals. We're seeing it anyway. But once you get to that level, you probably get to see why. Oh, this goes here. This goes there. 
use some virtual ma- machine stuff, you know, that goes there at the end user, uh, etc, etc, etc. So, all right, we'll leave it there for the introduction. Okay, join us next time as we begin to build. We're going to use Linux Fedora client and server, uh, Linux Fedora client and server 36 version, okay? Uh, kind of carried on in the C++ as simple as possible series. Uh, so visit the website, www.basicmaterialsproject.com, uh, Mixcloud, Soundcloud, and like and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. All right, thanks for your attention. I'll catch you in part two.